I'm sorry, baby, I don't mean to be rude. Yeah, yeah. I'm just a little different from all these dudes. Okay, okay, okay. They riding waves, me, I'm up on the cruise. Yeah, yeah. You feel like me, then you got nothing to prove. Uh, uh. I see I'm trying, trying to do what I do. Yeah, yeah. Hi, welcome to Glitching the Code. I've got a very special episode today for you. It's with Mark Miro. He's a former pro wrestler, but what he's doing now, he's going around schools all over the United States. He's the United States leading school presenter and inspiring young people with his story and with his faith. It's an incredible story in itself, how he's gone from pro wrestling to what he's doing now and all the battles he's gone through himself. I want to try and bring him over to the UK because we've not got anyone really like him doing this over here. And obviously with what children are going through right now, with the covid and with the lockdowns with the mask wearing not seeing their friends with um, being social distance for each other it's a very scary time especially for young people imagine what we were going through if we were 13 to, to 16 17 going through these very very weird times it's a fantastic interview i'm very proud to have mark on the show i hope to do a lot more work with him in the future so i hope you enjoy please go along and follow mark on all his social media i'll put all the links below and thank you for supporting the show and um here we go it's mark miro well, you know, believe it or not, at one time I was a young person <laughs> and, you know, I, I struggled with so many things when I was a young kid that today I can relate to so well. And I, I, I don't know, I've just been really able to connect with young people, you know, sharing my story, you know, sharing from my heart. I mean, telling things that normally maybe parents or adults wouldn't talk about that I was able to get through to uh, students that are going through similar things that I went through. Maybe it's a lo- the death of a loved one. Maybe it's brokenness. Maybe it's depression or anxiety or even suicidal thoughts. And and it really came down to there is no greater joy in my life than helping another person, you know, getting a letter or a person saying to me that you changed or even saved my life. No greater joy. It's it's amazing what your story is as well. Um, I know that you've been through a lot of like things yourself, including suicide attempt. You lost your mom when she was young and you were away doing you way resting at the time and your brother I swear I know you lost him when he was young how all these things kind of culminated in what you're doing because being a wrestler doesn't kind of correlate with what you're doing now people kind of might think how did you get into doing what you're doing today you know I I lost like you said I lost my mom at a young age she was only 58 when she died Uh, my little brother and sister both passed on at 21 my dad, my dad died while I was holding in my arms. I lost so many friends in the wrestling industry. And you're right, wrestling doesn't have really much to do with, with uh, public speaking. But um, after I retired from wrestling, I had the opportunity to come and speak to a, it was uh, one of the football coaches asked me to come and speak to the team, you know, about not doing drugs and doing the right thing in life. And I said, sure, I'll give it a shot, you know. And I couldn't believe all the letters I got from students' emails from the students that said, man, that was an amazing speech. You really changed my life. And I thought, well, that, it felt so good to help somebody else. And unbeknownst to me, they actually contacted another school that contacted me. And I spoke to the whole school. And it just started snowballing. And then some of my videos went viral. And next thing you know, I was going around the world. I mean, I went to uh, I went to Russia and spoke at schools in Russia. Uh, last year, before the pandemic, we were in Guatemala. And uh, I was on... Uh, we were going to tour the UK also, but unfortunately that fell through with everything that happened. But I, I really hope to come back. You know, I, I used to love going to the UK to wrestle. You guys are some of the craziest, most fun wrestling fans. And even with both companies, WCW and WWE, touring the UK was always fun because you knew the buildings were always going to be f- sold out. <laughs> the fans were crazy. And uh, But now to come back, and share my passion with UK students on relevant issues that they're going through, whether it's depression or anxiety or, or, or you know, living in a bad neighborhood, fear, the, the knifings that you guys have had are, are unparalleled. Like, we don't see that. And in the United States, we see a lot of gun violence, but the knifings that you guys have seen in the UK is, I, I read story after story, heartbreak after heartbreak of parents that lost their children to being being stabbed. It's just, just uh, uh, amazing. Uh, and, and what we got to do to combat these things. I see with what you do, um, storytelling is a massive part of wrestling. Obviously, the good guy, the bad guy, the that whole, whole story of, of the good guy and the bad guy. Do you think the storytelling that you learned, the psychology that you learned in wrestling about storytelling, about characters, helped you in storytelling now? Because a lot of what your kind of speech and your talk is based around stories, stories of life, stories of scenarios that you talk about. So how important is storytelling? You mentioned it before we started, the stories we tell ourselves. Storytelling is a huge part of what you do, isn't it? 
It, it really is. You know, I think what's really came through for me, though, more so than than being in front of crowds and wrestling. You know, I mean, I wrestled in front of the in the, the Alamo Dome in front of eighty thousand people. I was more nervous walking out to a high school audience of a couple hundred. You know, because uh, kids are man, you got kids are so authentic. They're so real. They want to see. They want to see truth. You know. So what I did was I I dug down deep inside myself and I shared relevant and real stories that happened in my life. And because kids could smell BS a mile away, you know? And I just shared real stories and it really affected students in such a positive way. And of course it gives you the confidence and you know to walk out in front of now we're walking out and with some schools bus all their kids into arenas for me where I'm speaking in front of eight or ten thousand students at once. So it's it's almost like the wrestling world in a sense I still get to go out there and entertain people, but hey, the good thing is nobody's hit me over the head with a chair anymore, okay? So at least not yet. <laughs> it's amazing when you see the, the reaction and the feedback that you're getting. I know one of your videos has done almost, I think it was a quarter of a billion views. I mean, it's the, your, your mother's love video. And guys, if you haven't seen it, I'll put the links below and I'll put all the links to Mark's YouTube channels as well and his Champions of, um, Champions of Choices. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But you... The reactions you're getting from kids as well. When did you first kind of realize that I'm onto something here? This this gives gives me something that I maybe didn't get from the wrestling. Well, you're absolutely right. This is something I I, I never experienced like this. At, I mean, we we receive hundreds and hundreds of messages every week, and of course, when the video was first viral, we were we were receiving. We had I remember the first week we had like. Uh, 3,000 booking requests to go around the world and speak. And and the letters we get from students and parents were, were, were just the most amazing thing. I mean, I would spend hours and hours answering letters or reaching out to people that were going through some hard times. And, and I realized I, I couldn't do it all. There was just too much to, and, and I realized how much pain there was out there and, 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 and how kids could relate to my story in similar situations. Maybe a, a, a student that was growing up in a single family home like I did. My mom worked two jobs, a, a rough neighborhood, worst drug and gang infested neighborhood in New York. And um, so many kids could relate to my story, losing a loved one, uh, being bullied at school, uh, being mocked and ridiculed and and, and, and not cared about, uh, feeling like there's no hope. So relating to all these students and hearing my story has changed and saved so many lives. We get letter after letter of a kid said that a student that write and say, you know, the day you came to my school is the day I was going to end my life, but you saved me or some, something similar to that. This is why it's so important to like spread your, your work and I'd like to be able to help you spread the work that you're doing over the UK because there's no one really doing that over in the UK with any kind of level of, of notoriety. Um, how would you say, if, if, there was a point in your life, and I know that you, you had a suicide attempt yourself, if someone come to you at that point and said, look, this is what you will be doing in 14, 15, 20 years' time, you would have gone, would have ever believed that that was a turning point in your life, looking back at the how life can change over a certain period of time do you believe that you were you survived that to be here to do this absolutely you know your your current trial is your future testimony and you know when you when you just said that it, it brings a smile to my face because you know mine was a real spiritual awakening too and every day when i wake up man i look up and i thank god i didn't make that decision to end my life i would have never known all the beautiful things that were to come in my life, new friendships, new love, new passion, a purpose in life to help other people. I never would have known these beautiful things if I would have given up years ago. It was 2003 and I'll never forget it. Since since 2003, I've been, I've been carrying on this, this torch of helping other people and now watching people that I have helped out there speaking and doing things and helping other people. It's just been a kind of a snowball experience for me where it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I know you've got kind of like a similar kind of view on life and, and a feel as DDP and Diamond Dallas Page. You have this positive attitude and he kind of went for a metamorphosis as well there. Do you feel, I know you're good friends, do you feel like that's something that kind of, that you, once your wrestling career ends, it's almost like being a boxer or a footballer, it ends as you're, you're still very young when it ends, isn't it? Um, do you feel like you have to kind of switch gears and kind of think about another life afterwards? Do you feel like you've had two lives? Yes, you know it, it's strange because DDP is one of my closest friends, and then we, we we just I just moved to Atlanta, so I'm real close to him, and we we've been doing the DDPY yoga workouts together, and uh, it, it's just 
we inspire each other. We both have done so many similar things in life. You know, um, I started before Dallas. I was one of the oldest rookies. I, I, I won rookie of the year at 31. He comes in and wins it at 35. <laughs> I was most improved wrestler. He did that too. I became a, a champion. He became a multi-world champion. I mean, he's just, he's just an incredible man and friend. And um, we, we, we found this joy of helping other people. Um, but after wrestling, so many guys that were used to the spotlight and the limelight and, and maybe the money and the things that they enjoyed during that career is all of a sudden ended. And it leads to a lot of depression, a lot of drug use, and it's hurt a lot of wrestlers. And even, unfortunately, many wrestlers have taken their life or, or died at a young age because of that. Um, but Dallas and I have tried to, you know, give the example of reinventing yourself, bouncing back, not giving up, pursuing a passion in life that you've always had. I mean, wrestling's not the end of all to our lives. It was just, a, it was just a, a few chapters in our life. There's so much more about life than just one particular thing, whether it's a sport or an activity or even a marriage. You know, marriages have come and gone and, and ended in my life where I thought I'd be married forever. And all of a sudden it ended and you, leave, you have that brokenness. And But it's about bouncing back in life and, and learning from your mistakes. Otherwise, they just become a new another mistake, but turning them into learning experiences that you can share and help other people. And what, what I love about what you do and the way you speak, I've obviously watched a lot of interviews you yourself and, and DDP. I, I do DDP yoga as well, um, and it's helped me know in the last uh, six, seven months that I've been doing it. I'm 40 now, and it has changed. I was born without an esophagus, so I have to, to battle through eating and stuff every day, and um, that's changed everything about me, and I feel a lot younger than I even did five, six years ago. But um, what, what what is fascinating about you guys is you don't blame other people for your for the things that have happened you've taken responsibility for everything that's happened to yourself and you hold no no um malice to anyone and i know you've been through certain things in your life which you could hold that malice how have you kind of let that go and what have you learned about letting go of past things that have happened to you and moving on well one of the things i i really believe in is not living a victim's mentality a victim's life of blaming or, or 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 you know having bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness in your life it just ends up being a cancer that 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 destroys you it, in fact it locks you in an emotional prison when you can't move on with with having bitterness or resentment or, or unforgiveness towards other people i noticed that my life completely changed when i when i i'm not mad at nobody and i can't blame nobody for anything bad that happened to me life is about choice we're defined by the choices we make in our life Sure, we've surrounded ourselves. I've surrounded myself with people that were, were suspect, and, and but that was my fault. That's my choice, you know. But when you blame someone, so, oh, they made me mad. No, you allowed them to make you mad, or they made me do this. Or no, you allowed them to do to make you do this, you know. So you got to watch being the victim, you know. Always, always portraying being the victim. It's a terrible way to live your life. Get over it. Forgive others. Move on in your life and make something of yourself. As you bring up choices, there obviously your your charity or your foundation is the champions of choices. Choices is such a powerful thing; it's a doing thing, isn't it? Having a taking a choice, taking responsibility. What we're seeing now with these children that have been going through the lockdowns, they're wearing masks, all these things that we never thought would happen to our to our kids, and I find it every day baffling. And it may be different here from the US, but here it's certainly diff, quite dark for the children here it's scary for the kids you have kids coming home saying i'm worried about passing this thing on to kill i might kill my nan i mean to put that in children's head is disturbing for me they feel like maybe their choices have shrunk what what do you see kids going through now in this last year i know you've not been able to tour like you do do you see do you think there's going to be a lot a lot more work to do when you finally get back out there in a completely different way than it was before you had to stop First of all, there are so many amazing young people out there. We don't give them enough credit because these kids have overcome so much. And, you know, we, 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 we kind of paint a lot of people with the same brush. Everybody's depressed. Everybody's, you know, is, is quitting or everybody's giving up. And that's not true at all because we're, I'm seeing perseverance. I'm seeing students overcome. I'm seeing students have taken this time and, and have, have, have put it into their future and, and you know, follow people on, on social media that they say, I want to be like this guy. But you make it your own. 
Um, you know, we could use doom and gloom all day long, but I really like to live with love and hope in my life. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we're now seeing a vac- vaccines that have came out. People are getting, you know, are, are, are getting vaccinated. We're seeing people um, starting to get back to work. We're seeing a lot of um, schools starting to open up again. We're seeing good things happening. And I believe it's it may never go back to the normality we once knew, but there's going to be a sense of normality soon. And I believe sooner than later, we're going to see a, a real change. But yes, going back to schools, I, I cannot wait. I cannot. I tell you, I just can't wait to the day I can get back on that stage and inspire students. I mean, we get to do it virtually, but it, it, honestly, it's not the same because mm-hmm. I'm looking at a camera as opposed to looking at a thousand kids. And, and, and of course, meeting students after and hearing their stories was one of the most enjoyable things for me was helping students that way, too. But um, it's just a matter of time before we get back to this, to, to being able to be around each other and give each other a hug or a high five or, you know, and not doing this social distancing these masks and everything else that's going on you know but it, it i think a lot of people are getting really tired of it yeah and um but you know obviously we have to be safe i'm not trying to advocate anything because gosh the you know how politically correct every word you say right now is you know i have my own thoughts on a lot of stuff but i'll tell you something i miss giving someone a big hug man or a high five or or, or hanging out with someone, man. I really miss that. And I look forward to when we can get back to that. But just don't give up hope, man. Don't don't act like this the worst. We tend to go to worst case scenarios. Yeah. Many times when, when we think of something bad, we always go to worst case scenarios like, oh my gosh, what is if this happens, you know? Well, I would say, what is if it doesn't? Chances are it won't be as bad as you envision because our minds are sometimes so negative and especially when you hang around other negative people. You know, there's a lot of negative people. People drag you down. You know, one of the things I share in my presentation, you know, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Your friends are like elevators. They either take you up or they're going to take you down. My dogs, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's the... What well, if I'm fascinated with you, Jeff? Sorry, they've just, the door... The, I think the postman's just gone. The, um, I, got, I got one, too, so you? if you hear mine... <laughs> That's okay. You'll, you'll, they go, go and I've been thinking they've got to go in a minute because it's five o'clock. Um, the, what what you just said there is about giving someone a hug and that and and having that closeness. What I find fascinating about that is because you worked in, in in the wrestling industry and it's not known for that sort of show of emotion. I, I can from someone who's followed wrestling for a long time. You're independent contractors. There's a hierarchy. Is that something you kind of had to kind of keep alive within yourself in that industry, or did you have to toughen up a bit? I mean, how did you kind of balance out that side because? I know that it's quite cutthroat, the wrestling industry, from what I can tell. You know, I'll be very honest. I've said this before. I was never very political in wrestling. I was not good at that. There were some guys that were, they were masters at it, you know. They could weave their way in and out of different scenarios, you know. But I was blessed that I got, I got a push for a while. And, and um, you know, but there are some guys that just are gifted at, at doing that. I, I was not gifted at that. But there are some guys that were, you know, I, I met a lot of guys that were real friends that I, you know, guys that would come and give you a big hug or were not afraid to grab your hand and say a prayer with you. Eddie Guerrero was one of the one of the best, you know, uh, guys that I, I love in that industry that were friends of mine. And to this day, Diamond Dale's Page, one of my closest friends. I mean, we we've been friends since what uh, we started wrestling. I started in 1991. So we've been friends for all these all these years. And, um, you know, we've wrestled each other probably a couple hundred times. I mean, I can't tell you how many times on pay-per-views we wrestled each other. Uh, and then on top of night after night in different cities around the world. And, uh, you know, enjoying that, you know, guys that, but there is a, you know, here's the thing with professional wrestling, you know, the guys that make it, and I'll give you an example, and I'm not exactly right, but let's say, for example, on television, there's maybe maybe 22 spots available maybe okay let's say let's just say in a, in a two hour program there might be 22 spots available for professional wrestlers okay if you're not jacked up and ready to go there are a hundred thousand people behind you that are so you just better be ready and and your profile can be raised or lowered by somebody's opinion a book or um something that someone got in someone's ear whatever you know and i mean some of the most talented wrestlers never really made it to the top you know there's guys out there that are just that i could watch in the indie show that go oh my gosh i've never seen a kid wrestle so well you know but because of maybe something political he didn't get his break or didn't get a chance you know i was lucky enough to get a, a chance 
by Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes saw me and, and saw this look I had and thought this guy can be a, a star. But I never would have. How, if he didn't say that, how would I have ever made it in the business? So you mentioned Dusty Rhodes. I know um, Diamond Talis, but I've got his book here, Positively Unstoppable. It's one of my, my favorite books. Um, he he talks about Dusty Rhodes a lot. Dusty Rhodes saw something, and you, and in, obviously um, DDP as well. Do you feel like you're kind of in a position now to be that kind of Dusty Rhodes for these kids, to see something in them? Do you try and find something in you because someone found something in you? Uh, you know, there's guys in my life. My my mentor, a guy by the name of Ray Rinaldi, was my boxing coach. Uh, was very similar to Dusty Rhodes, and, and Dusty Rhodes obviously giving me my break. You know, I look forward to inspiring young people to to go after their their dreams and pursue their passion in life, not be defined by other people's opinion. Because there's so many negative people. There's the people out there that say, you're not big enough to be a wrestler. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not qualified. And let me tell you, the reason why they tell you you can't do it is because they can't do it. Don't give up on your dreams and goals. I mean, if, if guys like Eddie Guerrero and even Chris Benoit, who wasn't the biggest guys in the world, became world champions, you know, people go, oh, they're way too small or whatever. Look what they've done, you know, and, and just give you just giving examples there, you know, of, of guys that overcome adversity or people saying you'll never be this or you'll never be that because of how small you're Ray Mysterio. Are you kidding me? Ray Mysterio, I mean, one of the most talented guys I've ever seen wrestle, you know, um, watching him beat Brock Lesnar, you know, it's crazy. It's amazing. I look at Ray because Ray's about the same height as me. I'm about five foot four. So we're about the same height, Ray. And I'd love to have been a wrestler. And obviously I was born with the esophagus issues and I had a lot of that. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're not physically big enough. And I, I get that. And I, and I can understand. And to see what Ray's doing. I remember seeing him WCW when I switched on in the early to mid 90s and seeing him flinging himself. I've never seen anything like it because I didn't know what Luchador was at the time. And that's when I first saw saw you as well. Um, as Johnny B. Bad, and I, and I just thought this is incredible what you guys are doing. I'd love to have been a part of it, but it was the storytelling I absolutely love. So, and then you mentioned Chris Benoit there, and obviously there's a lot of a, a lot of other things around Chris Benoit. But I remember when the tragedy happened, you came out and you had the courage to talk about the drug issues in in, in pro wrestling. And because of someone like you talking about it, now there's so many more things in pro wrestling to help people. And it's down to people like you for having the courage to do that. And I want to congratulate you for doing that because you did that at a time that you got no benefit from that for yourself at all, other than probably a lot of stick. How important was it for you to do that for yourself as a person to go, this is the right thing to do? Well, you got to be proud of who's looking back at you with the mirror every day. And when I was on those different television shows talking about the the downside of professional wrestling, the dark side. Those are things that I was um, able to do in my life, the drug addiction. And, you know, I mean, I missed, I missed some wrestling matches where I remember being pulled into Dusty Rhodes' office. He was the book at the time. And I'll never forget the, the heartfelt speech he gave to me, just me and him sitting in that office. And he said, kid, I made you and I can break you. You miss one more show and you're done. And it really hit me that, because of my drug addiction, the things that I was able to do because of the, the limited drug testing or the, the watered down, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, but today, because I spoke out and said enough was enough, we lost too many young people in this, in this industry that there's now the, some of the strictest um, Olympic drug testing in, in professional wrestling. Any wrestler that has ever stepped in the ring at WWE is now allowed free um, rehab in other words, you had you have any issues, no matter how old you are, you could be out of the business for 30 years. And if you have a, a drug issue or depression or something, you have to go to a, a, a facility, they will now pay for it. And and that's because of guys like myself and others that have stood up and said, enough, enough. We're independent contractors. We don't get we don't have no health insurance. We don't have anything. And now they're giving a lot of these things that that maybe we didn't have back when I wrestled. So yeah, am I ostracized from the business? Probably so, but that's okay, man. I lived the most incredible life. I All the different paths I took in my life has ended up to right here, right now, where I enjoy who I am, the person that I'm proud of looking at in the mirror, and hopefully the, the legacy I could leave, not from being a professional wrestling, but maybe the difference I was able to make in someone else's life. 
I think that's it. You're, you're the champions of choices, and we'll talk about that a bit more now. Um, that, that transcends a career, a wrestling career, a character, doesn't it? It's something for you to leave when, 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 you, when we're no longer here. Do you feel like you're building your legacy now? We'll come back to storytelling. How important is legacy? I, I know DDP talks about it. It seems to be wrestlers tend to have this understanding. I suppose you've got the Hall of Fame and these things. They understand legacy. They understand storytelling. You talked about chapters in your life before. You seem to have a very good grasp of what it means to tell stories and to, to convey your message through a linear kind of story. So you kind of, I suppose it's a, a way of living forever. You know, uh, my legacy is not going to be, um, you know, how many matches I might have won or lost in wrestling or how big my house was or how nice of a car I drove or how much money I have. My legacy is going to be the difference I was able to make in someone else's life. And that legacy will live forever as long as they can make a difference in someone else's life. And it just gets passed on. And that's what I really hope my legacy and my, my legacy will be. Um, professional wrestling was a, a small chapter in my life that I, I enjoyed. I, I actually quit wrestling when I had three years left on a huge guaranteed contract and walked away. And I'll never forget my last match was actually in the UK. It was Capital Carnage. It was me and Jacqueline against, uh, I believe it was Christian and, uh, no, it, yeah, it was Christian and Sable. Mm -hmm. That was my last match I ever had with, with WWE. And we were flying home from that, that event. And I remember thinking, I never got to travel again. I mean, I've already seen the world many times over, you know. And I thought, I don't have to travel no more. I can just take it easy the rest of my life. I, I At that point, I, I thought we had enough money to live the rest of our life. And, and, and then, of course, going through the heartache of divorce and the loss of loved ones and all the, and then, then going back to drugs, you know, getting involved in drugs again and destroying my life, um, and, and wanting to end it all, you know, and then making this amazing comeback, you know, where I said I didn't have to travel no more. All of a sudden I'm speaking at schools and churches and corporations all around the world and I'm back on the plane at 230 events a year. But now it's different because now it's not that I, I didn't enjoy wrestling, but there's never been the satisfaction I get as to what I do now, knowing every time I step on that stage, there is someone's life is going to be changed or maybe even saved from me being there that day. So that's the joy I have. So what came to the, what made you came? You had three years left on your contract. Why did you decide to walk away from wrestling? I know from the research I've done and knowing your story and following you guys for a long time, there was some bullying that went on. We don't have to name names, but there was some bullying that went on that correlates to probably what you're doing now, why you maybe feel so passionate about it. Why did you leave wrestling? You were at a certain peak. You were working for the biggest company in the world. You were intercontinental champion at one point. You were, you were doing, why did you walk away having still a, a gap there to still fill? Well, it's pretty documented. My my ex-wife, Sable, filed a lawsuit against the WWE for sexual harassment. And um, I knew, you know, even though we're, we're both, we both have separate contracts, you know, I knew my life would never be, you know, with her suing the company, I, I could never go back and, and be one of the boys, so to speak, you know. So I knew it was going to be a uh, an uphill battle that I wasn't worth wasn't worth fighting, and and of course supporting my my ex wife at the time, um, I'm I made that decision, and I, I have no regrets. I mean, you know, when you when you're in love and you're married, you 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 become one, you know, and you you work together on things, and uh, so like I said, all the paths I took, good or bad, <laughs> ended up right here, and I'd never be speaking to you <laughs> and all the great people in the UK. <laughs> It's it's amazing that when you walked away there and you but you said then that you had a kind of like a down where you went back to what what returned you back to kind of the drugs and 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 the life that you were living. I mean, it, you obviously probably had a lot of physical pain and the change of pace. You've gone from a hundred mile an hour all the way all the time away from home. I know you had children as well. Was it what what, what kind of reverted you back to doing these coping mechanisms at that time? Well. There's a, it was a, it was kind of like the perfect storm, you know, everything at the time you think you have enough money to live the rest of your life. And then you go through a divorce and then um, the housing market tanks, the stock market tanks, all these things that you are invested in. And next thing you know, you're wondering, how am I going to survive, you know, and, and, um, and then that just, again, surrounding myself with the wrong people, you know, wanting to go out and party again and, and get involved in the nightlife and then just, uh, just this downward spiral, you know, and you don't even, 
And it's almost like you don't even realize how fast it's happening, you know, and all of a sudden you're not keeping up with things you need to be keep up with your your appearance. I remember getting very overweight and, and letting myself go and looking in the mirror and hating myself. And, and then it just becomes worse and worse. And then gets to the point where your depression sets in and you party all night and you feel good. And the next day you wake up and you hate yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror and you and you can only do that so many times before you just say, I don't want to be here anymore, you know. And, um, and of course, losing the love of your life at the time, you know, and thinking, how do you how do you go on? And then making this amazing comeback where you, God, if I could say any words to all the people that maybe hurt me or whatever, is, thank you. I, I never would have been able to, you know, through these struggles, I found this amazing strength that I now can pass on to other people when they go through their darkest moments and, and not to give up. So that's the blessing I have now and the joy I have in my life. Do you ever say thank you to yourself, though? Because you were the one that turned that around. You were the one that took that, changed the model and reframed it in your mind. And that was from your effort to change around and say, OK, I'm not going to be angry at these people. I'm not going to be doing this. It was still you that did that, though. And I think children, kids need to do that. It's not some magical thing that came to you. You had to find the, something within yourself to turn it around and change. Your, your, and, and that's re-train train your brain or your outlook on the world. And that seems to be what you're trying to do kids now is trying to change their outlook on the world. How did you ch turn that round in your head? Was there a moment? Was there a process? How did you turn it around in your mind? Because that's where it starts, isn't it? Well, for me, it starts with some, you know, number one, it's my, my faith in God. I got a strong faith. But, you know, you, you have to have positive self-affirmations. We always tend to look at all the things we don't like about ourselves. You know, I don't like the way my hair is, or I don't like my nose, or this, or I'm overweight, or too skinny, or whatever it is, and we, we beat ourselves up so much. And the thing that I found, especially with young people, the hardest person for them to forgive is themselves. And I found the same thing with me. I couldn't forgive myself. And finally, when I was able to say, Mark, you're, you're human, you make mistakes, forgive yourself. And when I did that, it was like this, 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 this weight was lifted off my shoulders. And because you have to learn to love yourself. And I don't mean that in a narcissistic way. I mean, you have to love yourself. You have to be proud of who you are. You can't give away what you don't have. If you don't love yourself, how do you give away love? You don't even know what it is because you can't stand yourself. And that's how I felt for so long was when I hated myself, I couldn't, couldn't find myself loving other people. I couldn't find myself really giving myself away and being honest with who I am. You know, there's no better freedom than honesty. And I, I just was able to to do that, but now it's like helping other people to learn to forgive themselves. You know, sometimes they go, I go ahead and forgive that person, but they can't forgive themselves. We all make mistakes, we all have a past. You either grow from it, you either run from it, or you grow from it. And, you know, uh, you know, and sometimes the past comes and taps us on the shoulder. You know, people and things from the past come back. You know, you, you, know, you can look back, but don't go back. You know, say that's not where I need to go. You know, th th there's a reason why you know, the, the windshield is so big and the, and the rear view mirror is so small, okay? There is, yeah, and that's a great analogy. I think I heard Scott Hall say something similar as well. There's a redemption story to your story. There's a redemption story to Scott Hall, obviously, Razor Ramon, people, wrestlers, and, and Jake Snake Roberts, and even DDP. There always seems to be a redemption story. How important is it to be... My favourite film, is, by the way, is Shawshank Redemption. It's the redeeming factor. There's always a point, isn't there, that we can... Anyone who's listening to this now, and I'm trying to kind of give people a bit more positive... At, um, affirmations and, and outlook especially in the position we're in a lot of people have lost jobs they've lost families they've fallen out with people over things like whether to get this vaccine or whether to mask their children or whether not to go back to school it's very divisive the world at the moment and it never has yes. been so how are you coping in yourself how are you, like, how has it affected you this last year as, as just just as a man well, it was one of the most difficult things when, like, you know, when we were averaging, we were averaging over 14 years. I'm talking about 230 events a year. And remember, we're, we're doing this in usually 10 months uh, because summers when schools are out and we're doing, we're going nonstop. We're living in hotels, rental cars, airplanes all, all the time. That was my life. That's all I knew. And all of a sudden it was like, you don't have to get up early tomorrow. You don't have to go to work. You just got to stay home and, and the paranoia that everybody has, you know, wear a mask, don't touch anybody, don't touch this, put sanitizer on. Everybody's like freaking out, you know, and it's and, and then you watch the news and the news, 
my gosh, it's doom and gloom. You know, where's a good news story? Where's a positive story out there? And I said, yeah, I want to bring some hope to people. I want to, I want to believe that it's going to get better. I don't want to keep living in doom and gloom. Who wants to live there? I want to live with hope and faith that things are going to get better. We are going to be able to hug our our, our mom and dad and grandparents again. And, you know, we're going to be able to go places without a, a a mask on. You know, we're able going to be things are going to be back to normal. But I see the divisiveness and the fighting politically. Um, you know, and, and and now with with racism and everything else that's come to the forefront, we're 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 the media and everybody has blown things so out of proportion. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to minimize that there are people that have died and suffering. And man, some of my, I lost some close friends during this pandemic, you know. But sometimes they blow things up so bad that you are so afraid to leave your home. You're so afraid to touch something that that's not the way we're meant to live. You know, so I, I, I have a real problem with some of the stuff that young people are especially are hearing and how afraid they are and how nervous everybody's been getting. Um, there is hope. There is there's 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 life after death. There is there's life, there's hope after this pandemic. And I just want people to go out there and start living again. And don't keep thinking that we're gonna be living like this forever. We're not. Do you think there's hope in conversations like we're having now? I feel like the only cope hope that I'm kind of finding is that the conversations you have with people, even over the internet, these honest conversations, people seem to have got to the point now where they're honestly like want to reach out, they want to communicate and talk to people and, and find some hope. I feel, how are you feeling kind of like, how, where are you finding your hope? Where is that coming from? Who's supporting you at the moment? And when you have down days, I'm sure you do have down moments maybe. Um, where do you find that from? Is it your faith? Is that where you find it from? Absolutely. My, my faith in God is, is second to none. You know, I mean, oh man, I, I, I wake up and I just, like I said, I look up and I thank God every day. I'm, I'm blessed to, to, um, to be in a position to help other people. But uh, I, I have a strong faith. So, you know, um, you know, I, believe it or not, I turned 61 this, in four months. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not this young guy no more. But, man, I feel in my heart, I'm so young. I got so much energy. I, I believe I have many years left. But God forbid it ends tomorrow. God forbid. You know, I, I just lost a good friend. He was a pastor uh, friend of mine. I spoke at his church many times. Him and his wife both caught COVID and she was fine. And next thing you know, she's telling me he's going to the hospital. They put him on a ventilator and he died shortly after that. To experience that, knowing people that I love and care about, I realized how quickly it could all end. And even my own family, my like I told you, my little brother and sister died at 21 thinking they had their whole life ahead of us. You know, there's no promises of tomorrow. But I want to just say this. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that if God forbid something happened, man, I have lived the most incredible life. I'm so thankful. I, I live an attitude of gratitude. Um, I, I pray I have many years left where I can continue to be a blessing to other people. But unfortunately, if it did end soon, I, I know I, man, I'm just so thankful I've been able to do what I've been doing. Wrestling was great. It was a great chapter. But there's nothing that compares to what I've been able to do after the wrestling career ended just enjoying people you know the greatest commandments are <laughs> love god and love people and i do both you do and, and 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 where do you where is champions choices where are you going after this now the world has changed slightly where do you see the next say say it all opened up tomorrow and you could go traveling again and you went back to some sort of normal as you say it's not going to be normal completely the, the, we've, we've changed psychologically human beings have been changed through this process trauma does that to you where do you see, what plans do you have for the future? What sort of things are you looking forward to doing, changing, growing, evolving what you do? Well, obviously, um, the main thing is getting back out there to to schools and, and, and meeting students. Uh, um, um, one of my dreams has always been to come to the UK. And I, I hope and maybe pray that someone that hears this will be able to instrument that. It'd be an instrumental process in getting us into schools through through different programs where we could set up a whole tour, maybe a couple of weeks in the UK of going to school up school. We can do, we can do, you know, usually about three schools a day. Um, and how, how wonderful would that be to inspire UK students and start a, a, a whole, whole process out there of, of them inspiring other students and, and, and things like that. That would be great. Um, I, I, 
like I said, I want to do this as long as I can. Um, I, I'm, I'm enjoying every moment I have. Every day I wake up, every day is a blessing. Every every moment I have, I, I often say that I don't live in time, I live in moments, and I appreciate every moment that I have. So when this, uh, when we're able to go back, you know, we're already booking schools. I mean, they're assuming we're going to be able to come. So we're already booking uh, events for next school year. Uh, right now we, we're doing virtual events. We had a couple last week. Uh, we're doing uh, some more next week. And uh, I, I love doing them. I mean, because we still get a lot of letters from students, but there's nothing like being live to, to, to seeing these kids and, and, and being a part of their life. It's amazing what you guys have managed to do. And and I re- and again, I said at the start of this, the, we need something like that over the UK. So uh, we, maybe we can chat later on and we can talk about, because I would love to make a documentary about what you're doing. My, my, my background is I'm a documentary filmmaker. That's my, my bread and Come butter. On. And I know that my calling is to tell the stories of why people doing great things. Because other people are knowing that and hearing about it, it goes on, but people can't get the message across. And I would love to cover maybe we could get you here for two weeks and do it through iconic and i can speak to the guys about covering it as a documentary because i feel like this this needs to be shared even more and you can see from the 1.6 million and i think it's up to half a billion if you add them all together views of your your um your video about your mum um there's a calling for this but never never more so than, than now could you talk just a little bit about that speech you gave about your mum and why you think it connected so on such a vast scale um you know I, I had the most amazing mom. I mean, my mom was like many moms out there in, in the UK. I guess you guys call it mom, right? Yeah, mom. mom. You know, like the, the moms in the UK, you know, that just, I, I even wrote about this today was there, there's no other love like a mother's love other than maybe God's love. My mom adored us kids. And when she seen one of her sons become the kind of like that prodigal son that went off and did the wrong thing and got involved with the wrong people and drugs and alcohol. And she's a single mom raising us, working two jobs. And um, she'd wait up every night that she could, that she wasn't working late. She'd be up at night waiting for me to come home, just knowing I was still alive, praying for me all the time, hoping I'd become the man I I guess she she prayed me to become. And um, it was so hurtful because she'd wait up all night and I'd come home, my friends drunk and high and I'd walk in. And, and I remember well, one story was that I shared was that we pulled up in front of my, my house and all the lights were on. It was like three or four in the morning and my buddies were all drunk and stuff. And he, he goes, what a man, all your lights are on. What's going on? I go, yeah, my mother's up. Damn. See, my mom wouldn't go to bed until she knew her son was still alive. And she sat in this old chair in the living room. And the only way I get to my bedroom, I had to walk by my mother in the old chair to get to my room. And I, I, I hate those walks because she was always, n- number one, she was always so relieved to see me. She was like, hi, Mark. How was your night? I go, it's good, Mom. I'm just going to bed. And, you know, she said, well, can, can I talk to you for a minute? I go, Mom, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I get mad at her. And she said, I haven't seen you all day or all night. Can I please talk to you? I remember almost like begging me. I remember saying to her, man, you bug me. Would you just leave me alone? And I slammed my bedroom door on the one person that actually believed in me. That's how I treated my mother. And even when I made it into wrestling, I was too, I was so fixated on making a living that I, I forgot to make a life. And um, at the expense of, my mom, who loved me, all, all she ever wanted to do was talk to me. I mean, if I would have just gave my mom five minutes to talk to me, but I was always in such a hurry. And then when I was over in Japan and heard and got that phone call that uh, my mom passed on, it was the weirdest thing because it was like, number one, my, I felt numb. And I didn't have nobody close to me to, to hug or cry with or anything. And I just remember... Um, taking the elevator to the lobby and running through the lobby out the doors. I was in Hiroshima, Japan, and I just walked down the middle of the street. I mean, there was no cars, there was no people. It was three or three or morning or something. And, and I remember just looking up and I, and I just started telling my mom how sorry I was. I just said, Mom, I am so sorry. And I was just weeping in the street, crying, nowhere to go, no one to talk to. Just a broken man. I've just wanted five minutes to talk to my mom, to hear that voice. And and even when I think about it now, I get so, so sad, you know, 
but I know it's helping other people. I want my heartache to be your wake up call because we only have one mom, you know, we only have one dad. We only have maybe brothers or sisters that, you know, they're, they're forever. So don't, don't lose that opportunity. Do you, do you feel, sorry, do you feel like you're still talking with the work you're doing now? You're still talking to your mum. You're trying to show your appreciation for your mum still through the what you you're know, doing. I'm going to tell you something. I saved a lot of money on therapy, okay? Because <laughs> every day I'm on that stage is my therapy. And I know somehow, some ways, yeah, I have a strong faith. And I know maybe many people that have saw my presentation. Remember, I speak to uh, churches and corporations that maybe have passed on and gone on to heaven. And maybe they see my mom. They said, Man, your son is doing some great things. He became the man you prayed him to be. And so I have no doubt she knows how well I'm doing, that I have not touched a drug in, in 18 years now. I mean, uh, 2003 was the last time I, I touched a drug. So it's at, that's 18, 18 years, yeah, 18 years of, of being drug free. And so blessed that I was able to um, accomplish the things I've been accomplishing through speaking and, and sharing my mom's story, really, you know, a story of, of you know, redemption and, and becoming that prodigal son that finally came home. You know, maybe nobody was home when I came, but I, I came home. I finally came home. I think there's millions all around the world. I've seen 1.6 million people were home when you came home. They saw your video. They, they were yeah. home. They just needed you. They, they did. And they have, and they will do. And I'd like to help you trying to get this information, your story over here in the UK. Um, one point, a lot of people were home when you came home, Mark. And I'm the same. I haven't drunk for nearly two years. I had a bit of a drink, binge drinking issue for a long time. I haven't drunk in two years. I think it's next week. And I know what it's like to go through these things. And um, you need a reason to keep going. You need, But you find it within yourself, don't you? I love the fact that I'm not a religious person, I'm not, but I am a person of faith. I have faith in people, faith in stories, faith in redemption. And what you're doing is helping young kids. And also you are a, an example to people that have come out of the wrestling business or any business that they've had to come in, put all of their life in, and then come out and try and find a new life and build a new way. You and um, um, DDP are the same. Um, you've built a new, almost like a new character for yourself. Do you feel like you've reinvented yourself after wrestling in, in a similar way that you had to reinv keep reinventing yourself in wrestling. I just love the psychology of, I think the wrestling psychology can be used and transposed into all areas of your life. I always have done. I only wish I had this good of storylines when I wrestled. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, as people say, you know, you're a great speaker. I said, I only wish I could speak this good when I wrestled, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I, I really share with people about bouncing back, reinventing yourself. You know, I, you know, like I said, I'm going to be 61 coming up, and I'm not going to retire. I'm going to refire. It's all always about the next chapters in our lives, you know. But I want everyone in the UK to know that that you are the author of your story, nobody else. And and every day you can write a new page, and those new pages they become your new chapters. And just because many of you have had bad chapters just like me, it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. Don't ever give up. Your best chapters are about to be written. The, the rest of your life will be the best of your life. And you have to believe that. I know you've written a book, but I know it was quite a while ago. It was about 10 years ago you wrote a book as well, and it's out, and people can find it. I'll put the links there. Do you ever think you'll write another book? Because you've had another life since then. There's another, bo there's another book in there, I feel. Yeah, I, I did write a, a, another book with some other authors called The Wow Factor, we, where we gave different uh, parts of, of our life or whatever and, and different things. Um, but I, 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 I do want to write another book. And, and, and I'm glad I waited um, because I, I'm not one of those guys that I'm not a great writer and I don't put out a lot of material just to sell it. But I do want to share more about my life story and the, 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 the roller coaster of life, the good, the bad. And People, so many people think that 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 uh, happiness is a destination. But when you live for that destination, you live a very sad life because you happiness is part of the journey. And more important than being happy is being content. You know, we my life's not perfect. There's good. There's bad. There's people that that die. There's people I lose. Uh, you know, my my little dog's 
11 years old, I can't imagine my life without my dog, you know? There's certain heartaches that we go through. Life is not perfect, but it's about being content in life. And I have never been more content than I am at this point in my life. And and that's why I'm 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 happy. And that's why I'm I am grateful. I'm I can live a life that I could say I'm 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 proud of. There are moments, yes, I've done some really bad things and stupid things that hurt a lot of people. And I often say this, that there, if there's anyone out there that I have not apologized to and I hurt you, my God, I am so sorry. I, I really am because I never want to live a life that this guy did this or that guy did that. I have no bitterness towards anybody in the wrestling industry. I didn't have some of the best friendships with some of the guys, but today, I, there's not one person I can say I don't, I dislike. Well, you have a lot of people talk very well about you ddp talks well about you chris jericho these people all steve austin they they all talk about you in a very very lovely way in a a, a way and what i love about you what these big guys these big muscly guys and big guys throwing each other around the ring but actually all at heart you're all big all very much brothers who've been through something together do you feel like you're fat you still you've taken a little bit of a family away from from pro wrestling you've all seemed to kind of support each other and that what breaks my heart like someone like marty Jannetty, who's out there guys you don't know marty Jannetty, who's a former rocker with Shawn michaels he seems to have drifted away but you have all supported each other do you, how important is it to still have that support after pro wrestling with others who've been through the same thing and maybe that can correlate to people that go through the same thing someone who's had a mum who had cancer someone who's had a child who's been abused or they've been abused as a child to find people that have been through similar things and support each other after the event and on in life you know, it's amazing the camaraderie we have with each other now, um, as opposed to even when we wrestled, you know, like where there was always, remember, you're always competing. And when I say competing, you're competing for certain spots on the, the ladder to success in wrestling, if you will, you know. And um, Steve Austin and I were never um, real good friends. We wrestled each other many times. We were never close in wrestling. And after wrestling ended, I mean, I haven't spoken to Steve, you know, in like, 20 years you know and he and he asked me to do his podcast and i said absolutely and we did the podcast and after the podcast was over me and steve stayed on the phone for another man 45 minutes or an hour just talking about life and we realized how much we both have in common and man just built a friendship a camaraderie you know that we'll always have i mean if i ever see the guy again and i mean it's like a big hug he's like just just a great guy you know um, same thing with like a guy like uh, uh, JBL, who I was not very close with. We, we probably didn't say some nice things about each other. We fought each other in the brawl for all. Yeah. Um, uh, and now I see what he's doing with other people, with kids. What a, what an amazing man, you know? And I, I let him know how proud I was of him. And, and now we're, God, I know if I ever see that guy, you know? <laughs> There's not even a hate, hateful bone in my body, you know? It's like I'm so grateful that we all buried the hatchet. There's no animosity. There's not someone I'm going to get on there and talk negative about and say, this one did this to me or this one did that. You know, It's like, get over it, man. We, you can't live with this resentment or bitterness in the past. Life goes on, man. You pointed out that I'll wrap this up because I know you're busy, but I, I wanted to ask you just when you, you touched upon something there of reaching out to someone like JBL and saying how proud you are. I remember DDP said it the same with Ric Flair. He reached out and he, he healed some old wounds. How important is it to tell people that maybe you haven't gotten with how healing is it then to, to reach out to people, to tell them how proud they are, you are of them and how well they've done that moment. How healing can that be? It's the greatest feeling in the world. I tell you, um, forgiveness is so important. You know, um, we some of us have said some really nasty things about each other over the years and to to own up and say man i'm sorry and i'm proud of who you are and what you're doing today or whatever the case may be and i know ddp and i were such close friends and i knew the story with with uh, him and rick and and um and what it, what it went through but i knew how good dallas felt after they were able to you know to just you know smash that or you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, put put that behind them, so to speak, you know, and uh, me having the same thing with maybe guys that I wasn't real close with now that are, I would consider friends for life now, you know, I would never, never have nothing negative to say about these people. Even if, even if I don't agree with something, whether they're it's political or something, I'm not going to come out there and bash someone, you know, the thing was, is we got to learn to be able to agree to disagree in this world. You know, we get, 
we, we, we tend to hate people that don't think the same way we think, you know, and, and that's wrong. You know, we, we're, we're made so differently and it's okay if someone thinks differently. And um, I, I, when, I, when I was in Los Angeles or California, I spoke at all these schools and one of the groups they had me speak to was the LGBTQ kids, you know, and, and man, I just, I just show love for everybody. You know, there might be things I might disagree with, but it, when you have love for people, it, it transcends everything, you know, and and I think they could feel that that that, you know, the way I am. I'm not here to judge nobody. It's not my place to judge people, man. But I tell you something, it is my place to love people, and I and I love people. I, I don't I don't love people that hurt other people. I tell you that that that's something that really when I see a kid getting abused or bullied, that that never sat sat well with me and never will. And especially knowing as a little boy of what I went through. But so many friends that I have, including Dallas, guys that were bullied and now help other people. When we see a, a kid uh, hurting another kid, we are the first to step up and say that's wrong. And a lot of times I speak to the bullies and they end up crying to me because I find out that they were once bullied. And it's kind of a power play. Like now I can pick on someone else or be more powerful than someone else. So I'm going to hurt everybody I can. And, but when they realize that when you help other people, <laughs> that's the greatest feeling in the world. And that's where um, people that have been bullies that came to me go, I apologize to something I did to someone. It's the greatest feeling in the world to know that you had the impact to help them and not, not beat them up or hurt anybody. So if you had to look, David um, David Goggins calls it in his book, he's like a motivational speaker, the cookie jar. And when he feels down, he was knackered, he couldn't go on. He looked into his cookie jar and he pulled out bits of inspiration of things that he got through, things he was proud about, things that pushed him through so he could find that adrenaline to that second wind. What's your most, pr- what, looking back, what's your most proud moment um, of, of your life? And what's that moment you look back and go, actually, if I was remembered for, even if it's just a personal moment and no one else had to see it, my proudest moment that really showed me who I was as a person. I guess, oh man, it's emotional when I think about it, was um, becoming the man my mom prayed me to be. The man she always knew I would be. Where I would look at her like, what an idiot. You know, why would you ever think that? You know, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. I would think so negative of myself. My mom would always tell me, you're a great man. You're going to do great things. And um, I still got a long ways to go, you know, but um, every day I'm better than I was the day before. So, um, but I know there's going to be a reunion in heaven with my mom someday. And that's my faith. And um, and I, people have their own beliefs and stuff. And I, I respect that. But mine is, I know there's going to be a reunion. And I want to tell you right now, that celebration will never and that's what I'm looking forward to. Well, you are a great man and you have done great things and you're doing great things. And I appreciate your out, uh, giving me an hour of your time. I really do. Guys, please go over to, to uh, Mark's website. So, Mark, where can people find your stuff? Where we can support the work that you're doing? Uh, you know, if you go to YouTube, it's uh, you know, youtube.com forward slash the Mark Merrow. And Mark is M-A-R-C-M-E-R-O. If you're on uh, Twitter or Instagram, it's just at Mark Merrow. And if you're on Facebook, it's uh, the Mark Merrow page, P-A-G-E. So I'd love to, you know what, if, I, if you do write to me, tell me you heard, heard this program, okay? That would be really cool to know that it reached you over in the UK. It would be really awesome to know that. And I'd love to be part of what if you when you do come over to the UK, we'll make it happen. And we'd like to Let's I'd love to make a touch. film of it because I, I genuinely would love to make a film about those two weeks. What an incredible film that would be, guys, um, on Iconic. And we want to spread this message to kids. Kids need it right now more than ever. So I want to be part of that. I really do appreciate your time genuinely, Mark. And I'd love to do this again sometime. It is a pleasure to meet you, and let's stay in touch, and hopefully we we'll work together, and maybe we we'll make a documentary together in the UK. That would be great. I would love to. Guys, please share this about. Please go over and like Mark's pages, follow his work, especially on Champions of Choices, his website, um, and I will put the website below. Um, thank you, Mark, for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys got something out of this. This isn't the be all and end all. This is, a, this is a moment in time where we can really find out what we're made of, and, and um, we're at a point where we can really dig deep, and I think right now, we actually are looking at ourselves going, look, this is, we're quite amazing humanity and human beings. And um, Mark, thank you for your time. 
God bless you. Bye-bye. I'm sorry, baby. I don't mean to be rude. Yeah, yeah. I'm just a little different from all these dudes. Okay, okay, okay. They riding waves. Me, I'm up on the cruise. Yeah, yeah. You feel like me, then you got nothing to prove. Uh, uh. I see I'm trying, trying to do what I do. Yeah, yeah. Even me.